This week, we unpack the craziest cases in law. Michael Costanza sued Jerry Seinfeld, claiming that the character George Costanza was based on him. Yeah, don't put that on your Match.com profile. Uh, Michael Cohen pled guilty to something that isn't even a crime, and Pornhub was sued by a deaf man under the Americans with Disabilities Act. These cases, plus Mackenzie Smith and I unpack the timeless classic, Legally Blonde, all in this week's Debriefing of the Law. I teach this class for lawyers where I unpack the top 10 craziest cases in law. If you are a lawyer and in need of CLE classes, please check out this class. It is available online at www.comedianoflaw.com. We offer it as an on-demand class, a webinar, and as a live class. We unpack the actual law behind the crazy headline cases. Because who knows, maybe one day a person will come to your office who just spilled hot coffee in his tender area, and if you had taken my class, you would know the relevant precedent. Well, recently, Mackenzie Smith and I talked about these craziest cases, and we both shared our favorite two to three wackiest, craziest cases. Here is our discussion. Well, welcome to this week's edition of Debriefing the Law. I am Joel Oster, your host, and Mackenzie Smith, welcome. Thank you for joining us again today. Thanks for having me. Now, today we are going to talk about several very fun things, so I hope you stay around for the long bit. Where we are headed is to give you our expert legal opinion on Legally Blonde. This might shock you, but there's actually some real... Legal issues that were truthfully depicted in Legally Blonde, and so Mackenzie will have her own very unique take on that movie uh, once we get to it. But first, what I want us to do today is to unpack the craziest cases in law. I teach this class called the Top 10 Wacky Cases. We were, we debrief the law, and we try to analyze what is the the law behind the last, if you will. And so today I wanted to just have a little bit of fun as we review some of those cases. And Mackenzie and I are going to give you both what are two to three funniest cases, craziest cases, wackiest cases that are out there in the area of law. And before we go to what your 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 top three are, I want to know, what do you think is the definition? What did you look for? What defines a wacky, crazy case? If we're going to have our top ten Surely we have to have standards. And so how do you define a crazy case? So I think there's like, it has to be one of three elements. I think you either have to have a crazy lawyer who's doing something totally off the reservation that like a normal lawyer All right, all right. Lawyer has gone AWOL. Lawyer has gone wild. Or you have to have a crazy client, obviously, which means that the, the person, the litigant is doing something. Right totally outlandish, which, you know, happens a lot. And it happens in, as I was reviewing these cases, I noticed that it happens in some jurisdictions more than others. Right, Um, right, 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 (laughs) right. Or... Like, I had a... One of the cases that did not make my, my top 10 list is Marshall v. Marshall. And I think what you're just saying there, it has to have some kind of celebrity status to it where you have some client who's acting real crazy. Are you familiar with the Marshall v. Marshall case? No. That did not make my top 10 list, uh, but it really should because the players there, you got Anna Nicole Smith. I don't know if you know the story of Anna Nicole Smith, but uh, she was a stripper. uh, And uh, this, I think, 90-some-year-old tycoon, Marshall was his name, saw her at a strip club and said, I finally found my soulmate married her and so promised to give her half of all of his estate. He was worth billions of dollars. Well, his, uh, so right there, you got a guy who's 90 years old going to a strip club, marrying a stripper and then giving her half of his estate. When he has kids who are probably not too happy that he's giving away half of his estate, uh, McKenzie, that case made it to the U.S. Supreme Court. So that that pretty much does hit on all levels, but it did not make my top 10 crazy case list. So yeah, you, you do look for a celebrity status. Yeah, I agree. no, I think I saw, I think I watched that on um, E! True Hollywood Story probably like 20 really? years ago when I used to watch that show. I okay. think there was a whole, you know, a pretty solid documentary about it. 
So if your case ends up on Dr. Bill's show or E! True Stories, that also is an indicator we're talking about a pretty interesting case. But that did not make my top 10 list, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully I'm, I'm pumping it up how good our list is. Well, what else did you look for? So I think, and then the third, the third factor would be if you have, you know, a crazy system somehow, it could be a crazy judge or a crazy cop or something like that, but you'd be surprised with how, I mean, maybe you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't, but people would be right, surprised right, right. with how many is just like wild judges there are out there. Sometimes I see, like, I'm, you know, a decade into my career as being a lawyer. And I, right. whenever I go to court, I'm like, man, I would love to be a judge. Like, I'd love to wear the robe and, you know, judge people all day. And, you know, but it seems like such a lofty goal, like becoming a judge. That's like a big deal. But then you hear about some of these judges and you're like, oh, my gosh, like, I'm way better than any of these people. Like, I, I have know. to be more confident than like, you know, a significant percentage of judges out there. So, you know, there's some crazy I think it's those are actually usually the most wacky. Like when a judge does something wild, I remember um, there was a, a legend and I don't know if it's like a you know, an urban legend in the town where I used to work um, in the courthouse. But there was a legend about this one judge who actually, I think, threw a stapler at an attorney really? during a trial, um, just out of, out of pure a frustration and anger. And so, you know, the crazy stuff happens. Wow. Well, we got, luckily, there are videotapes now in courtrooms, and there's one incident, which you attended my class, so I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this, um, where a judge in Melbourne, Florida, was so ticked off at the public defender, it, this is all caught on videotape, so we play it, the judge asked the public defender, hey, why don't we go in into the back hallway and I'll beach your backside. Now, he didn't say backside, he said another word there, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, and the public defender said, all right, let's go to the back in the back hallway. And he went to the back hallway, and you could hear on the uh, the videotape this judge just pummeling this public defender. Now, Mackenzie, the uh, the downside of that story from this public defender's perspective is this judge had a special ops training, so he is fully equipped to beat this guy's backside, which he <laughs> did. The judge then came back into court to a standing ovation. I kid you not, everyone was very excited that this lawyer got his comeuppance. Either that or they were fearful for the lives. I'm not sure which way this one cuts. But yeah, you. I agree with you, Mackenzie. If you have a weird acting judge, something that is uh, unusual, then that definitely is going to make our list as a wacky case. So also, I, I think you alluded to this, you have to have a weird Holding. In other words, the issue in the case has to be something maybe that just entices you, it grabs your interest. If you can have a something like that as well, then that's going to make it for a very interesting case. Now, there is there is a current one right now. Did you fo- have you followed the case? Now, I know you're not a big sports fan, so I hate to put you on the spot, but um, do you know who Zion Williamson is? No idea. If you told me you'd give me twenty bucks if I could identify the correct sport, I couldn't do it. All right. How about this? You know who LeBron James is? Yes. Then you will know who Zion Williams is in a few years. He is that good of a prospect. He is an amazing player. When he was a high school student, his slam dunks were legendary. It went viral on YouTube. He played for Duke for one year, was the number one pick in the draft last year by the New Orleans Pelicans, and he is an amazing, amazing player. Well, he is a subject of this lawsuit. So right there, McKenzie, you got the recipe of a very fun, interesting case, right? You got a guy who's already gone viral. He is a celebrity. He is a basketball player. So we got that element to it. Well, what happened was uh, there was this agency out there, this sports agency. They signed him up as a play, as a under an agency contract while he was a player at Duke. Now, generally, that is a problem. Uh, in fact, there's a law out there that prohibits sports agents from signing up players who are in an amateur status. So if you're an amateur playing for college, you can't have these vultures coming in and trying to sign them up. So under general rules, that would be an invalid contract. It would be illegal. But the reason why this case is interesting is the sports agents are saying, look, Zion wasn't an amateur because he already was being paid under the table by Nike. And so they are alleging that because Zion was being paid, 
Now, McKenzie, if he was being paid, this would be a huge deal. I mean, this would rock the sports world. Duke University with their pristine coach, Coach K. If they are playing players who are being paid under the table, well, he would not be an amateur. He would be a professional, and so would not. He would have. Um, they would. Duke would have to forfeit their games. So this is a really big deal. Uh, you know, the NCAA is watching. Well, so here's what happened. The attorneys for the sports agency asked Zion Williamson, hey, were you receiving payments? Did you demand payments while you were a player at Duke from Nike? Now, that is a, that is a very loaded, potent question because if they, if they answer that question and the answer is yes, Duke is in a lot of trouble. They are probably going to be suspended, kicked out of the tournament for a year, if not more. Uh, it is going to up in the sports world. And so Zion's attorneys, which I'm sure at the behest of Duke, said, don't answer that question. Just dodge it. We don't want you answering that question. And they filed a motion with the judge to quash that question. Well, the, uh, the, the court responded last week by saying, no, it's a valid issue if he was being paid. He was not an amateur, and so uh, is a relevant question, and ordered Zion to answer the interrogatory. Well, that's where the case stands right now. Again, this promises to be a huge, huge case. I will be uh, following it in my class as well, or covering it in my class. So, McKenzie, in, in, any, in any event, that is a current wacky case. Do you have any, um, how about this, McKenzie? Do you have any personal cases that might fit <laughs> the bill of a wacky case? Oh, now, not God. personal that you're representing now, right? I don't want you to rat out your clients, but I'm just saying, <laughs> are you familiar in your past with any interesting cases? Oh, God. Um, yeah, no. So just like as a blanket statement, I would never <laughs> rat out any of my clients, no matter what. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was sued <laughs> once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was sued. Did I hear you right? You were sued once? I was sued. I got really? The, I got the crap sued out of me when I was in college. No. <laughs> yeah. So, you were sued while you were in college. Now tell me. Yeah, so um, what had happened was, so I went to Tulane University down in New Orleans. Okay. That's four years of my life. Where Zyde Williamson is playing right now. You should know about him. There, I'm going to let that one go. slide. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I did not go to new Orleans for the sport. So I'll tell you that, but, um, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. I, so I went there. The gumbo was good. Yeah. I had like three best friends, my freshman and sophomore year, the four of us were pretty inseparable. And then I went to study abroad for my junior year. Um, and the, okay. the deal that I had with my three friends was we had lived in the dorms our first two years. So during junior year, they were going to find, a house. There aren't really that many apartments in New Orleans. It's mostly right. houses. So they were going to find a house off campus for us to okay. live in for our senior year. And, um, you know, we would all be in it, the four of us together. And I was just trusting them to, this is your first red flag when you hear the word, <laughs> trusting them. I was just trusting right, them to like, right. find a good, a good place, which, you know, they did the best. It's nothing against them. We're all still really good friends, amazingly, um, having gone through this together. But, <laughs> So they, right. none of us had two nickels to rub together. You know, we were poor college students. So they found right. a, I guess, quote unquote, first floor apartment, or it was like the first okay. floor of a house, which the first floor, it, it was really a basement um, apartment, but <laughs> New Orleans doesn't really have basements because it's under sea level. So it's kind of the weird houses swimming pools, it's like, right? Yeah. It's like a half basement, like maybe the bottom, like six feet or something are like technically underground, but then like you do have okay. windows and stuff. So anyway, they get this place, they start living in it over the summer, come August of my senior year. Like I go down, I move in and I had never signed the lease. They, the three of them signed the lease. Um, but wow. I was paying, there were like maybe two or three months where I was still abroad, where I was paying them. I just like sent them a check for my portion right. of the rent so that they could, you know, they wouldn't have to pay my portion. And then I moved okay. in and, you know, it's September, hurricane season. So a couple of hurricanes and okay. storms come through and the place floods. I mean, just floods. Right. There was like sewage. So you were there during the hurricanes. Yeah. It, well, yeah. I actually graduated like two months before Katrina in 05. So, but we ah, okay. did, every year we would have, you know, like a couple of bad storms that were really, okay. um, you know, like shut down classes for a day or two or whatever. 
So, you know, this place was flood. It was totally uninhabitable. And like I said, you know, they didn't know this, obviously, when they signed the lease or whatever. But our landlord, turns out this guy was like a total slumlord, like totally okay. easy and wouldn't come fix. Like he wouldn't do anything. Like every time this place would flood, like the toilets would back up. It was just, it was awful. Like it was so bad. Uh, a slumlord. Yeah, yeah, total slumlord. So we tried to contact him. Like the third or fourth time it happened, we're trying to get a hold of him. He can't get a hold of him. He's not answering his phone. He finally like blocked our numbers, like wouldn't come fix anything. And so we went to a lawyer and we were like, what should okay. we do? And the lawyer goes, that's constructive eviction. You should move out. Right. So we moved out and we moved out. We got another house, which was like awesome. So many great memories there. This is like two weeks into senior year. And uh, another hurricane comes, and this one's like an evacuation hurricane. So I fly home okay. to Philadelphia, and I'm at home for like a long weekend to pass the time during this hurricane. And <laughs> a registered like FedEx comes to my door, and I open no. the front door, and this guy goes, you've been served. And I'm like, what? Oh, you've been served. Yeah, so the landlord uh, sued us for the entire wow. year's term of the rent. And not only did we like not get the case dismissed right away, but we all had to be deposed. Um, I sat for wow. like an eight hour deposition and well, an eight hour deposition yep. over this issue of rent. Yep. And and I wow. guess there's some like I didn't understand anything about the legalities of it at the time. Like I had no idea what was going on. All I knew right. is that the lawyer eventually said that I had to get my own lawyer because I never signed the lease and there was a conflict of interest and I ended up getting okay. out on summary judgment. So I won, but yeah, it was wacky because I had to disclose this to the character and fitness examiners. <laughs> when I took the bar exam and was like trying to get a law license. You have to disclose if you've ever been a party really? to a lawsuit, if you've ever been sued. And I don't know if it was because of Katrina or whatever, but the records, like all the paperwork for this lawsuit was like destroyed or like didn't exist anymore wow. by the time. <laughs> so I had to like sign affidavits and it was just such a mess. And somehow I still wanted to become a lawyer after this, but that's your introduction. Yeah, that was my introduction. Like, so before I ever set foot in law school, I had been deposed every lawyer's nightmare as being a defendant, so right? <laughs> So you won the case, it looks like, because you never even signed the contract. So clearly they couldn't sue you. Uh, but how, how did your, your roommates fare? Did they, did they also win? They did, but I think they had to, they may have settled. I can't remember exactly, or they might have won on a later summary judgment motion. But they right. mine was decided right at the end, right before we graduated. So okay. when I graduated, I knew that I was out of the lawsuit. Um all right. They actually had to fly back. We were all from out of town. They ha had to fly back after we graduated and like come back and appear wow. for something. So it was just the whole thing was a complete mess. And, you know, you, here's the you, other reality. you realize how good of friends you have when you can, a friendship can survive right. something like that. Like you really like know that you have each other's wow. back. Yeah. Because here's the other reality of it. I mean, you guys flew back. You had several depositions. This is probably only for less than one year's rent. I mean, you couldn't have been suing. They couldn't have been suing for that much amount of money. And so maybe they were hoping you guys would just settle and just move on with your lives. But nonetheless, it sounds the way you portrayed it, that is a very solid evic uh, constructive eviction case. I would think, though I don't know New Orleans law or, or Louisiana law in, to, that, uh, to that extent, but it does sound like a, a strong case. I mean, it was it was totally wild. And yeah, I mean, the moral of the story is at the time, you know, we were 21, 22 years old and we were like, we're not giving this guy a dime. We didn't do anything wrong. This is a matter of principle. Well, as it turned out, like I ended up spending exponentially more on a lawyer than I would have right. to confess judgment and pay my share of the right. rest of the year. So word to the wise, like listen to your lawyer when they say you should just settle and walk away. <laughs> it is so hard for clients to accept, but that is really solid advice because you know what? You only have one life to live. And usually the only parties that win in lawsuits 
are the lawyers. And, and so it's just, you, you got to almost say, hey, look, I want to move on with my life. How can I um, like move past the situation as fast as possible? Don't let things get too personal or else you might make a bad decision. Now, let me tell you about my, like, probably the craziest case that I was involved with. And I would be very curious to see how you would handle this argument. But I got a call one time. I was uh, in Orlando, Florida, working for a law firm. And I got a call. Now, I did First Amendment law. That was my specialty, constitutional law. And I got a call one day from some uh, potential client. And they said, Joel, we want you to represent us. We were given a cease and desist order from the city of Ocala. They're going to, uh, we, they're going to face, we can face a $5,000 a day fine unless we stop our religious observance. Now, McKenzie, do you know my response was when I heard that? <laughs> what was it? I'm on the next oh, plane. Oh, <laughs> sweet. Supreme Court, baby. This is a great case. So you're being fined $5,000 a day for holding a Bible study in your house? That's outlandish. So I think only lawyers actually get real inner joy and glee when someone else is facing a horrible situation because they're in despair and I am elated. Well, I, you know, I lived in Orlando. Cal was only about a couple hours away. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to go out and meet you the next day tomorrow because this is such a great case that's what we do we go out and we meet the clients and we sign them up but Mackenzie something came over me and I thought maybe I should ask a few more questions and so I said what what kind of church do you belong to it said first church of life out of Modesta California now Mackenzie have you ever heard of that church never heard of it I had never heard of that church as well. I have since Googled it. I know all about that church. But at that moment in time, I had no idea what the first church of life out of Modesta, California was. Apparently, it's this mail order church where you can just mail into them. They give you a pastor's license so that you can do whatever religion you want. I had no idea about it at that time. But nonetheless, I asked a few, I, I asked some questions. Well, what do you believe in? Well, they said this, that, and the other, and alternative lifestyles. You go, all right, you kind of perked my interest now. Alternative lifestyles. What do you mean by that? Well, they hemmed and they hawed. And finally, they kind of, after beating around the bush, said, we believe that clothing is optional and we engage in partner swapping. I said, uh, 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 come again? Did I just hear you right? Because I got to tell you, McKenzie, that does not sound like any Sunday school I have ever attended <laughs> in my life, right? I, I, I assume you have a similar experience. I think my 11-month-old is a member of this church, actually. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. That makes sense. I would understand that. Yeah, you know, um, but nonetheless, so I, um, I said, no, they're not shutting you down because you're holding a Bible study. They're shutting down you down because you're operating a whorehouse out of your place. It was a nudist colony and a swingers club, and they were wanting me to argue that was their First Amendment religious expressive rights. And so I thought, well, it's a pretty interesting argument, but I cannot take that case. My boss would not let me. Though I got, I am a little bit curious. I do regret not ever following my number one rule when <laughs> meeting new clients. You go out and you meet the clients, right? I should have went out and met the clients, but I didn't do that. What an interesting story I would have had to tell my wife when I got home. She would have said, how was your day, hon? And I would have said, oh, uh, interesting, you should ask. I attended a Bible study today, but I did not get my one interesting uh, moment there. So, well, nonetheless, those are some personal interesting cases. Let's now go over our top three crazy lawsuits. And so, Mackenzie, I'll let you start off. What uh, What is your third craziest lawsuit out there? All right. So, so I'm starting with my number three craziest. Yes. Okay. So my number three craziest is Michael Cohen case. And I think it okay. hits on, you know, a couple of the points that we talked it about does. earlier because it does have that celebrity aspect right. to it um obviously i mean come on the president of the united states is involved that has to hit on the the, the celebrity factor absolutely and you know obviously he was a celebrity before he was the president um so right you got this situation where <laughs> where there was i guess uh donald trump had an affair allegedly with a right, right. <laughs> with a playboy model back in you know 2005 2006 and then, okay. you know, come 2015, 2016, he decides he's going to run for president, doesn't want this right. to come out, so he's going to pay her off, allegedly. Right. Um, right. And Michael Cohen, who is the president's, or Donald Trump's personal lawyer at the time, he's talking to him about this, and he records the conversation. 
He records All right. The now I want to just ask you a couple. I want to ask you a couple questions about this. This story amazes me, and there's some things I don't understand about it. But first of all, Michael Cohen described himself as a fixer. Now, Mackenzie, did I miss that law school class? Did they teach <laughs> fixer law for you where you went to school? Yeah, no, we didn't have the class on fixing at all. It reminds no, me of like, I missed it. George Clooney in that movie, <laughs> Michael Clayton. Right, exactly. you, know, you have to have the initials MC. If your initials are MC, you can be a fixer. But yeah, it's just I so guess bizarre. so, right. So I have no idea what a fixer is. I I, I never uh, applied for that position, but he is a fixer. Uh, and so um, th- there's a, a a porn star now, um, uh, or an affair. I'm sorry, and uh, he represents the president. And you said he recorded his conversation. Now that's problematic. I mean, have you ever done? Will you re- secretly record your client's conversation? No. So it's you know it's different state to state, but in in my state in Pennsylvania, like it's. I'm pretty sure it's a felony. Well, it might be a misdemeanor. Either way, it's totally illegal right. to like secretly record someone when they have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the conversation. Um, you can't what get you a, a wiretap violation. That- Right. Now, you just divide it into in state by state. And here's why I think you were going with that. Uh, in that some states, it is legal if uh, to record a telephone conversation if one of the parties knows it's being recorded. In other words, if I'm calling you and I'm calling from a state where it's only a one-sided has knowledge, one-sided has knowledge of the conversation, then it is illegal. But in some states, and New York is one of them, it is illegal to record a conversation unless both parties on that, uh, that call knows it is being recorded uh, or both parties in that room know it's being recorded so here michael cohen this was in new york new york that is their law both sides have to understand it is being recorded uh, and so this would have been a violation of law as well yeah so that's the, your first problem like you don't want to just be like committing crimes like <laughs> right right you know? and, <laughs> like look i mean i'm not going to talk about politics we don't need to talk about politics let's keep this light there's a lot of need that's for right. comedy going on but you know i think We've touched on before how I am a liberal. So I'm game to talk about how awful Donald Trump is like any time. Like I do not like him <laughs> in the right. train. I do not like him in the rain. I do not like him here or there. I do not like him in the Oval Office. But I got to say, like, all, so as a liberal, like I would love for like Michael Cohen to be an unsung hero here. But he's just like abjectly awful. Like he's terrible. Right, right. You got to use the term lawyer loosely here. He reminds me, you know who he reminds me of? Uh, Saul who? Goodman from Better Call Saul. Like he's like, yes. it's like, do you want a criminal attorney or do you want a criminal attorney? Like he's <laughs> I know. a criminal. Um, so it's wacky on wow. so many levels. His office ends up getting raided by the FBI and they find the tape, which I guess he was keeping his illegally recorded tape just like in a desk drawer in his office. Wow. So, uh, yeah. I can't even imagine that. I mean, this is going to yeah, get you that, disbarred. So I guess, you know, you have to have a backup plan if you're going to do something like this as a lawyer. And my ultimate question is, like, if you're at the point in your career where you feel like you need to secretly and illegally record your conversations with your clients for potential future use in, like, a campaign finance investigation or extortion right. or whatever he was thinking, like, maybe at this point it's time for a career change. Just become a right, YouTuber right. or a podcaster or something like that. Like, you should not be practicing. <laughs> hey, you know what though? As you pointed out, as you pointed out, he does have a good future with some kind of sitcom, TV, Netflix special on Better Call Saul. You know, live version. I, I don't know, but yeah, uh, he he's in. the most interesting thing about this case. And this, you're right, this hits on so many different levels. I can't believe this is number three. I'm very excited to hear what your your number one and your number two are, <laughs> but. Um, he pled guilty at the end of the day to something that is not even a crime. Now, I was following this case as it was going on, and I practice in the area of campaign finance litigation. He pled guilty to a campaign fa- campaign finance violation. It wasn't even a violation of the law. Here's what I'm talking about. You are allowed. Uh, now, obviously, the campaign finance laws says that you cannot make a contribution to someone who's running for, for office outside of the, the, the normal rules. And so uh, in you, know, you can't uh, make, you know, like, let's say I want to give money to Donald Trump. And he's going to run for president. Uh, and I, I, would, I don't want to give the hypothetical for you. That's too far outside of the, the realm of possibility. <laughs> but let's just say I lost my brain, didn't care about my, my money, and I made a donation. You got to record that. You have to disclose it. You can only make it within the certain limits that are allowed for a campaign contribution. All right. So the allegation here was is that 
um, Michael Cohen gave this porn star or whoever this was who had the affair, um, whatever it was, $100,000. I don't know what the, the settlement was, but he gave them that money to shut her up. And that was a contribution in kind while Trump was running for president. And so that was an illegal campaign contribution. But I got to tell you, McKenzie, that is not because you are allowed to engage in business or in things that are in the ordinary course of business. And unfortunately for most Americans, him paying off people on behalf of Donald Trump, that was in the ordinary course of his business. That would not have been a campaign violation. Yeah. But nonetheless, he pled guilty to what was not actually a violation of of the law. But, yeah, I, I agree. That is a is a is a crazy case. Yeah, right. and it was like only a uh, hundred thousand dollars, which like, you know, if you're gonna kind of demand hush money from Donald Trump for like having right. an affair, like go for more than six figures. Like what are you doing? I mean, come on, like I, that's my advice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Donald Trump is, is probably good for a little bit more than that. So maybe he, he, um, uh, maybe the fixer here did a good job in, in that regard. Uh, but yeah, that is a, uh, that, that definitely hits on all levels. Well, yeah, my, no, Who knows? Maybe he was a good lawyer at the end of the day <laughs> or a good fixer. Uh, at, least. Hey, at least he was a good fixer. Well, he, like you said, he's, I'm sure finding a new line of work, he will be disbarred if he's not disbarred already. I'm sure it's just in the in the works because if you are if you commit a felony of lying, then you are going to end up going to uh, losing your license. All right. Well, uh, my number three was or is Costanza v. Seinfeld. Are you familiar with that case? No. Go for it. Yeah, I'll tell you what, this one hits on all levels because it involves Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, so it has to, you know, it has to be a fun, interesting case. Michael Costanza sued Jerry Seinfeld under the theory that Jerry based the character of George off of him. And so he sued Jerry Seinfeld for misappropriation of likeness. Now, McKenzie, this is why I find this case fascinating. Do you realize what he's actually doing? Michael Costanza? He is going to court, and when you go to court, or do you not place your hand on the Bible and say, I swear I'm telling the God's honest truth. If I am fudging just a little bit, throw me in the slammer. <laughs> it is a major, it is a felony to misrepresent the truth when you are in court, right? Correct. All right, so he is in court, and he's saying, look at that character, George. Look at him. He's short. He's <laughs> fat. He's bald. He's ugly. He can't keep a job. He has no luck with women. Well, guess who is the inspiration for that character? That was Mawa. I am short, fat, bald, and ugly. Can't keep a job. Haven't had a date in years. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd recommend putting that on his Match.com profile, but he was willing to say that about himself because he is suing Jerry Seinfeld for several hundred million dollars. By the way, a short story, uh, or long story made short here, Seinfeld won that case. The court said, no, no one has a right to privacy to prevent your likeness from being used by some comedian who's making a sat a satirical comment or make, you know making fiction, making satire. So one of the best one-liners I've read in any court opinion, the court said, while a sitcom could be about nothing, a lawsuit has to be about something. And so then sanctioned uh, Michael <laughs> Costanza several thousand dollars for bringing this claim. So that is my number three craziest case. What, what is that. your number two? All right, Isn't that so a good one? My number two is the bag full of drugs case. And this yes. case, I'm just going to like take a pause to <laughs> let the listeners guess what state this criminal case comes from. Wait for it. It's Florida. Right. Surprise, surprise. Um, and this Florida. Case, yeah. So, so the cops I stop love a Florida. car. Um, the car is going 25 miles an hour over the speed limit. So totally legitimate traffic stop. They stop the car. So Police officer comes to the window, looks in the window, and then sees a bag sitting on the passenger seat that says bag full of drugs. So wow. Police, it says the, the yeah, so they there's literally the bag. a bag and his bag on the passenger seat that says bag full of drugs. Correct. And, you know, I think so there, I'm, there's I'm, no way. Was yeah, that? I'm positive this is going to go down as like a bellwether Fourth Amendment case, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> so here's the issue. Surely, if someone has a bag in their passenger seat that says bag full of drugs, 
I mean, there's no way that that bag actually contains drugs, right? I mean, there, there would be no way in this world someone would be that stupid to place drugs in a bag that's labeled bag full of drugs. Tell me, what, what, what was in the bag? The bag contains meth, cocaine, MDMA, <laughs> fentanyl, which is like super lethal, and something called GHB, which I don't even know what that one is. Um, but wow. apparently it's a drug. So there was like wow. a lot of drugs in the bag. So the issue in the case is like whether the cops should have gotten a warrant. Cause like typically you can't just search the contents of, you know, okay. someone's car, like unless it's in plain view and they had to, you know, the bag was zippered. Um, but right. as it turns out, there's plenty of precedent that says you don't need a warrant to open up a bag within a vehicle. If there's probable cause, that, you know, something that the, there's evidence of a crime or like there's something, you know, contraband in the bag. And, you know, when you label okay. something bag full of drugs, I got to say, like, <laughs> I feel like that's probable cause. Now, let me just unpack that because you are former prosecutors. I really want to know what you think here. Probable cause. Does that not mean more likely than not? Is, is that a 50 percent standard? H- how would you equate? How would you explain the probable cause analysis? I don't even think it's more likely than not. I think probable cause is there's some evidence or like in this type of situation, a reasonable person could reasonably suspect that there might be evidence of a crime. Like, it's a very low threshold. Okay, it's a very low threshold, because here's what I find hilarious. That lawyer's going to have to go in court and say, Your Honor, come on. They, clearly the police have violated my client's Fourth Amendment rights because there is no way anybody would be that stupid <laughs> to put drugs in a bag labeled bag full of drugs. So my client over there is an idiot beyond idiocy. Uh, you know, he's the king of idiots. Uh, no one with the right mind would ever think that would actually contain drugs. But the, co- the judge would then look at his client uh, and say, yeah, no, I'm sorry. It, it did contain a bag full of drugs. This one is on, <laughs> is on you. So what, what happened in that case? You know, I don't even know. I think it might still be going on. It was just like a recent case. But, um, you know, you if you Google this case, you can see the bag. And it's okay. like a cute little pouch. Like, it looks like it's from Etsy. So I look it up, and it, you can actually purchase this bag online okay. for $18.99 plus tax. And the description from the website says, there's nothing more fun than walking around town with your ironic bag full of drugs. Perfect for getting a laugh or a stare out of passersby and taking advantage to poke fun at profilers looking to judge you for your amazing swag. (laughs) Um, So I think like the lesson here is unless you want to get searched, you know, just don't carry the bag around town. Okay. Even if you're carrying it, quote unquote, ironically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my goodness. I can't even imagine that he would have a let's see, I got my grocery bag here. I got this <laughs> la- bag labeled bag full of drugs. Which one should I put my groceries in? I, I don't know. That's just kind of a very very good case there. I can see why that is number two. That definitely hits on the the funny element when it comes to the law. And so a very unique, ironic application of the law in that particular context. Well, my number two. It's Kavanaugh v. Bartell. Now, have you heard about this case, Kavanaugh v. Bartell? No. Do I want to hear about so, this case? <laughs> well, so right at the beginning, let me just tell you, this is not Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh. This is a different Kavanaugh. And so this Kavanaugh is in prison in Nebraska. Now, there is a law called RELUPA. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of RELUPA. I, it's a real fun-sounding name, but it stands for the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. And under RELUPA, a prison has to accommodate a prisoner's religious beliefs unless the prison can establish that, no, we can't really accommodate this person's religious beliefs because, you know, for whatever prison reason. But they have to have a compelling reason not to accommodate it, and whatever their policy is has to be narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. That's a lot of legalese. The bottom line here is there actually has to be a real good reason not to accommodate this client's religious beliefs. Okay. All right. Sorry, I had, uh, I'm going to delete this part out, but I just got a phone call. I, just, I wanted to delete that phone call before it kept beeping on me. <laughs> All right. So pick back up here again. 
All right, so Mackenzie, let me ask you, if if this is what this person's religion, he belonged to the church of the flying spaghetti monster. Have you ever heard of such a church? No, but I, again, think my 11-month-old might be a member. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, this is what they believe in. They believe in this noodly appendage in the sky that controls our destiny. They believe that we descended from pirates, and so they talk in pirates. How much fun would that be? I matey shiver me timbers. And they believe the afterlife. Get this. Get tell me if this would not be the greatest way to recruit members to your church. They believe the afterlife consists of a beer volcano and a stripper factory. And so that is what this person's religious beliefs were. And he wanted those beliefs accommodated while in prison. Now, Mackenzie, I got to tell you, that is pro- if these beliefs are accommodated, this is going to be the most popular attended Bible study in the history <laughs> of prison Bible studies, right? Uh, a beer volcano, I don't even know what that would look like, but clearly it would be well attended. There would be a waiting list. Uh, and so the actual outcome of this case was the court said... No, we're not going to go there. This is not a religious belief. This is a joke. This is satire. You don't really have these religious beliefs. It's too far outside the mainstream. And so the, the prison did not need to accommodate the person's religion at all. So there you go. That is Kavanaugh v. Bartelt. Has nothing to do with Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. All right. What is your number one case? So my number one wackiest case is a case that's currently pending um, I think it's in the Eastern District of New York, and it is Deaf Man Sues Pornhub under the Americans with Disabilities Act. <laughs> okay, um, all right. And I would like to unofficially nominate the New York Post for a Pulitzer okay. Prize because I was reading their <laughs> article about this case, and the first sentence of the article is, a deaf man from Brooklyn is moaning that he can't fully enjoy videos on Pornhub because they don't provide closed captioning. <laughs> Like no, did he really write that? If that's not like brilliant journalistic writing, I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so me being the nerd that I am, wow. I, I pulled the case off um, Pacer, and this guy didn't just sit. Well, first of all, since January, he has sued Pornhub, Verizon, Prometheus Media, Microsoft, like a bunch of other people. He, this guy's like okay. on a crusade, and it's they're all class right. action cases. Um, but, you know, in the complaint, apparently this individual, the plaintiff, uh, pays for a premium subscription on Pornhub. Okay. And he is alleging that he cannot fully enjoy videos such as <laughs> Sexy Cop Gets Witness to Talk. Um, and that's unfair and that the ADA requires them to provide closed captioning. But, you know, wow. I, my take on this is like, I got to say, I don't think the point of Sexy Cop Gets Witness to Talk is the content of what the witness actually has to say <laughs> so much as the, you know, shall we say, interrogation techniques. So I don't I... know where this case is going to go, <laughs> but when I'm reading this, I cannot, like, this is an actual an actual thing. Um, and apparently, to be oh. fair, um, the CEO of Pornhub has come out and, you know, they don't usually talk about pending litigation, okay. but he has reminded the public that Pornhub actually does have a closed captions category. Um, so, okay. Yeah. So you're saying you might be able to excuse Pornhub in this one particular instance for not thinking that it's the, the compelling dialogue that drives their sales. So it might be something other than the well-scripted dialogue in conversation that why people might be uh, downloading their videos. Very fascinating. So this was an ADA law, right? Americans with Disabilities Act. That's what this lawsuit was about. Correct. And I think, um, I don't know too much about the ADA, but I know that in order for the ADA to apply, the, uh, the, I guess, website in this, situation has to be considered a place of public accommodation. And I don't know okay. what the definition of accommodation is, wow. but I'm just very interesting to see, you know, the legal arguments on both sides uh, as to whether Pornhub.com is a place of public accommodation. Well, you know what? Actually, you hit on a real legal issue. So that's why this is a great number one, number one, the, the salacious details, the facts. This is just a funny storyline. Uh, this is going to definitely make it into my uh, stand-up routine. This is just a funny uh, story, you know, fact pattern. But the, actually, there is a real legal issue here. And the issue is, if you have a website 
on the internet, how do you make that ADA compliant uh, for blind people and for deaf people? And that actually is a real legal issue because they, they are saying that is a place of public accommodation and you need to make your websites compliant for people with disabilities. So that actually is a real legal issue that might impact a, a lot of listeners. All right. Well, I got to tell you, I think... Yours probably beat out my number one. My number one is the case of Bubba the Love Sponge. Have you heard of this case? <laughs> no. Well, Bubba, first of all, he is out there. I mean, he is known. Uh, and so he is a shock jock. He likes to shock people with his his radio shtick. If you don't know who Bubba is, he um, he also was in the news of late. He lent his wife out to Hulk Hogan. I'm not sure how, how, how all that worked out. Hulk Hogan slept with his wife. That guy caught on videotape, was released by Gawker to the public, became the subject of a $140 million lawsuit. That's not this case. This just shows you the kind of high-profile nature that is Bubba the Love Sponge. Well, in any event, the facts of his story, of his case, aren't that compelling. He uh, uh, he basically decided to castrate a pig on live radio for the entertainment value. Have you ever heard a pig being castrated on live radio? No, that sounds horrific and really barbaric, and I don't want to listen to it. Yeah, I can't imagine this being quality radio entertainment. I will note that my wife does instruct me when I tell this story, I'm I'm not allowed to smirk in the least little bit. This is animal cruelty. I will note for the record that in Kansas, we also call that the start of a good barbecue. But nonetheless, how you prepare your meat makes all the difference in the world. And this is animal cruelty. And so a criminal investigation was commenced against Bubba the Love Sponge for animal cruelty. All right, there was another shock jock in town whose name was M.J. Schnitt. And M.J. In his, was another shock jock, so he was a competitor of the Love Sponge. Well, his wife, Michelle, was in law enforcement. So Bubba said, do you know who's behind this criminal investigation? I bet you it's, I bet you it's Michelle and M.J. So, so he is a rat and she is a whore. That's what he said about uh, them on his radio program. Well, M.J. did not like being called a rat. I hope also defending his wife's honor played some role in his decision. But nonetheless, they sued Bubba the Love Sponge for defamation. Are you following me so far? Do you have any questions about this lawsuit? I mean, I have questions about (laughs) the people and the facts, but legally I'm following you. All right, defamation lawsuit, Bubba castrated a pig on live radio. Uh, there's a criminal investigation. Bubba called these people you know, all kinds of horrible names, and so there's a defamation lawsuit. Now, uh, during this lawsuit, now have you, you've you been involved in some really important litigation. I have as well. You, so you know this to be true. Sometimes lawyers get caught up in the moment, right? <laughs> they let their competitive juices get get uh, you know uh, control. They lose a little bit of perspective, if you will. And so these lawyers from the Diaco Law Firm, Bubba's lawyers, they probably got carried away here. And so they came up with a trial strategy. Now, McKenzie, I am going to put you on the spot here because I know you and I know what your answer is going to be. But um, you have never come up with a trial strategy like this. Have you ever thought of, you know, we could do to score some points with the jury. How about in this case, why don't we get our opposing counsel, get him drunk, uh, get him, you know, drinking, get him drunk, get him in a car driving. He's going to get busted for a DUI. Won't that score some major points with a jury? So, Mackenzie, I'm going to put you on the spot. Have you ever got your opposing counsel drunk just to score some points with a jury? Yeah, I have not, but I also right. question whether that's even admissible. I mean, clearly it would be happening out of court. How would that right, even be right. relevant or admissible? I mean, it just sounds like, I mean, it's obviously an evil strategy, but it also sounds like just a stupid strategy. <laughs> like, right. Can you imagine that? You you want to get your opposing counsel drunk because, by the way, this is a high-profile case. So these are two shock jocks who are dueling it out. The entire Tampa community is following this case. So it is going to get out there. And that, that was kind of their thought. It would just get out there. Everyone would talk about it. The jury people would hear about it. So they did this just to score some points with the jury. Uh, here, here's what happened. They sent their paralegal, Melissa Personius, to this bar, Malio's, that Campbell went to every day after trial. So the opposing counsel is sitting there at the bar. Up comes Melissa Personius, and she starts to sweet-talk him and buy him some more drinks. 
Uh, now, right there, I, I got to just pause here. I, I hit time out. Mackenzie, would you not agree with me that without knowing anything more, this guy's got to be disbarred for, be, for being too stupid to see a setup, right? <laughs> yeah, that's totally. not how that. That's not how the real world works. If you ever have a much younger lady buying the older guy drinks, getting him drunk, yeah, his antenna had better be blaring. There is a setup in the midst here, and before the evening is up, I'm going to be out a few Benjamins. But nonetheless, he, I guess, was liking the attention, got drunk. Finally, she said, hey, here are my car keys. Would you go move my car? And he does that. He goes to move her car. Of course, she didn't, she, the cops get contacted. The cops come arrest this guy for a DUI. It runs as the lead story in the, the evening news. They did all of this just to score some points with the jury. And so, uh, again, this this case hits on all, all four cylinders for me. By the way, the, the result of this case, Bubba the Love Sponge, Won the lawsuit. Both sides were figured to be public, you know, figures. It's just radio shtick, and so there was no defamation. These were all public figures, and so, um, but the Bubba's lawyers, they were all permanently disbarred from Florida. Uh, so yes, another Florida case because this was clearly way outside the role that lawyers should play. So there you Wait, go. I feel that like is I my would number. Have prosecuted them for soliciting a DUI. I mean, you can't. There's a crime. It's at least reckless endangerment. I mean, you can't you, wouldn't you think intentionally, so? like, I, I mean, you know, I guess there's a, there's a men's right, like, I'm not a men's right, but like a causation. You can't like right. intentionally cause someone to commit the DUI. He could have said, like, I'm not getting in the car, but like, you can't, you can't just like set someone up and like promote and, and, uh, aid in a bet. <laughs> I guess. Right. A DUI. I, like, you I, yeah. can't do that. Well, nothing actually happened on that front. In fact, the DUI charge against uh, Campbell, the other attorney, was dropped because the police were a part of this setup, if you will. And so no DUI charge. Those charges were dropped. And uh, and here's actually the rest of the story, what happened to the other lawyer. So uh, he was the one who was too stupid to see the setup, and his client lost the case. The client refused to pay his legal bill, which already was $900,000. And so Campbell had to sue his client for legal fees, and a jury returned a verdict for $500,000. So I have no idea what the takeaway from that story is. At the end of the day, Campbell was the one too stupid to see the setup. He gets drunk. Uh, he is driving, uh, you know, gets a DUI. You know, just because a pretty lady asked doesn't mean you actually have to drive drunk. There is no requirement of that. And he, uh, his charges are dropped. He loses the case. At the end of the day, he walks away with over a half a million dollars. So I have no idea what the moral of that story is. Yeah, I mean, it's probably the same moral as in some of these other cases, but I don't know what it is either. I'm not living by that playbook, so whatever. It, it's <laughs> just for us to know as lawyers, okay, I will know that now when I um, per, um, per, uh, have a strategy in a case. I will not use as a strategy getting the opposing side drunk. That's not going to end well for my career. All right, well, yeah. this is a great <laughs> segue to the movie Legally Blonde. And so we watched this movie last week, um, first time I've watched it in a long, long time. And I wanted to watch this and offer commentary on whether or not this movie accurately depicts the legal profession. And so, Mackenzie, I'll let you have a first shot there. Just go ahead and explain a little bit, because I believe this was your choice. Why did you choose this movie? Because it's the best movie ever. Um, It's so great. (laughs) You know, I, it I was a fun even, movie. Yeah, going back, you know, it's one of my favorite movies, just in general, not even just legal movies. But you know, and yeah, I have, I have a personal connection to it. Like, I it came out in two thousand one, which shockingly, okay, I can't, I can't believe it's already almost twenty years old. This movie, I would like to know, just as a side note, like what skin cream Reese Witherspoon is using because she looks exactly <laughs> right. the same. Totally unfair, but you know, I was twenty college, years and, old. Yeah, it's so wild. Wow. Um, but yeah, I was in college and thinking about going to law school. So, you know, I'm also... <clears throat> and you're blonde? And I'm, I'm a nat- natural. I'm a natural blonde. Um, so, you <laughs> okay. know, this is, it's good that this is a podcast. You know, you can like get away with whatever you want. You don't want to see what my hair looks like after three months of quarantine. But um, yeah, so <laughs> okay. being, being a blonde and 
thinking of going to law school at the time, it really like, you know, struck a chord with me. And it's just, it's a great movie. I think, you know, it's obviously not a totally accurate picture of what law school and internships and yeah. obviously criminal trials are really like. But honestly, right. it's like not any further off than any other, you know, comedic law movie. It's just as accurate as my cousin Minnie or liar liar or anything else. So, you know, I don't interest. Now those are fighting off. words right there. We're gonna we're gonna fight over those before the end of the day. But nonetheless, let's just start <laughs> off because I am now I am fascinated. I want to hear your take. So when you started the movie, the opening scene was this is it a sorority? Am I saying it that is that what that is? A yeah. um a sorority picture and the camera was going through the sorority house and there were all these sorority members doing exercises is is that reality is that really what sorority houses do i have no idea i was not in a sorority i mean you heard my but i was getting sued in college (laughs) i was not that's right that's right i live in a sorority house i have no idea um but it definitely has that early 2000s vibe right like all the fashion right, right. is on point and there's so many movies like that coming out at the time like college movies and like perfect pitch right. and all these other it's, it's on point for the era i think okay so as the movie goes, it, it starts off and she was dating this guy and thought that he was going to propose to her. Instead, he was going to break up with her because he was going to Harvard Law School and had to have a serious girlfriend. And apparently, L. Woods was not a serious girlfriend, and so he broke up with her. Well, she was all depressed about that, and so she decided... I want to go to law school and win my guy back. Now, so right here, I want to ask you this question because I wrote this down because they said this during the movie and it just shocked me. Here's what they said. Law schools are for people who are boring, ugly, and serious. What is your take on that? What was your response? I mean, have we met? Like, clearly. No, I mean, he wanted a brunette. Like, in the movies, brunette people are serious. And blonde right. people are not serious. And he wanted a brunette. And you have to go to Harvard Law to find a brunette. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> law school. No, I had a great law school experience. I have wonderful lifelong friends that I made in law school. They're not boring people oh. to me. But, like, you know, I like to talk about law stuff all day. So I don't know if I'm just right, like right. too in it to, like, you know, have any sense of perspective. But, I don't know. I mean, I got married like in my first semester of law school. So I was definitely boring. Like I was not partying. I was not fun. Um, But, you know, and then again, I'm not too much of a serious person. So I think it probably depends on the law school. I also didn't go to Harvard. So who knows what it's like there. That is true. I I um I went to uh, I got married my first year of undergrad school. And so I was definitely married by the law school years. And I, hey, I, I, I'm kind of with you. I am boring. Uh, I, I, I hope I don't add, I'm not on the ugly part, but nonetheless, it, um, law school, it was a lot of fun. Life does not get better than in the law school years. Those were great years. Now, I want to point to this next development in the movie, because I thought this next development was just idiotic and ridiculous. So I want to get your take on it. The LSAT. Now, I assume you, do you remember your LSAT years when you had to study and take the LSAT? I do, unfortunately. All right. yes. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to ask your score. I don't want to know what your score was. But it, it ranges from, I think, about a 120, 130 to a 180. That is the range of, uh, at least that was the range for LSAT scores when I took it. The first time she took it, she got a 143. That's basically putting your name on the, the the form. That is like a horrible, horrible score. I can't even compare it. Let's just say you took the ACT score. That's like getting a five. I mean, that is a really bad score, right? 143? Yeah. And then she took it again, and she got a 179 which is one point away from acing. And so I might have been playing up a little bit that 143 was that bad of a score. But nonetheless, here's my main point here. You can't go from a 143 to a 179. That's just not real stuff. Would you agree with me on that take? Oh, totally. And I don't, I mean, listen, we don't know Elle Woods. We don't know what she's capable of. So who are we to judge? But I would say uh, that is, 
very statistically unlikely. And if I remember, I mean, it was a long time ago for me too, but like, if I remember correctly, the LSAT's really hard. Like it's not, it was hard. It's not easy. Like I, I'm, I was always a really good test taker and didn't really, you know, have anxiety about taking tests. Right, right. So I, you know, but the LSAT, I think for me, at least, I think it was like just as hard as the bar exam. It's really hard. It's not an easy test at all. So 179, it, it, it I did has, not, was not my score. <laughs> no, no, 179 is, is darn acing the thing. And so I, I have no doubt that she could have scored a 179. My my beef with this is she would not have started with a 143. Uh, you don't go from 143, take a couple test prep classes, and end with a 179. That's not how the LSAT works. She would have probably got a 165, 170, took some prep classes, and then got the 170. But I don't know. That's just my mind. She my could take have just on, been on really that. upset from the breakup the first time. See, I mean, you that's know. why I have you on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> good good point on that one. All right. So she then goes to law school at Harvard and she is kicked out of her first class. I just want you to comment a little. Is that a real depiction on law school? Because I got to tell you, that's what I thought before I went to law school, that it was going to be some horrible Socratic method. They're going to put you on the spot, embarrass you. Law school was nothing like that. It was a very enjoyable experience. I was never put on the spot like that. Was it uh, different for you? Um, well, my, my one professor, my contract professor, my first year did do like a total Socratic method. And like the first day of contracts, you know, he picked someone out of the list of students and was like, stand right. up. What's the holding in this case? And it was kind of like what you read about what law school is going to be like. But I think we, you know, thinking back, I think we kind of knew like, oh, that professor does this. And everybody's such right. a gunner in law school. Like you're all such nerds that like you read the cases, like, you know, you're not going to class unprepared. I mean, the people who go to class yes. unprepared, like don't, aren't there the second year, like everyone, why are you <laughs> going to go to law school if you're not willing to work hard? Like everybody knows it's super hard. You have to work, you have to study a lot. Like you're good. If you're if you want to pass the bar exam, like you're going to have to get comfortable with studying like all the time. So, you right. know, everyone knows. I mean, you you could be wrong because you misunderstood the case or whatever, but like no one's going to be like, oh, I didn't read it. At least that was my experience. Maybe I just went to a really good law school. I don't know. <laughs> and, and in my law school, it was those those classes that did follow the Socratic method. And for you non-lawyers listening, that would a Socratic method. I think this is what they're, they're referring to when during class they will pick on you and they will ask you. The, the professor will ask you some questions about a case. You have to recite the facts, maybe why the court held the way it did, what the ruling was. So they're really kind of teaching by pulling out from the students various aspects of, of that particular case. And so uh, that's kind of the whole thought. You go to law school, it's a Socratic method. You're gonna, they're going to put you on the spot, train you how to be, be articulate on your feet. The law school I went to, it was never a random guess. So you basically knew when your day was going to come because they would just kind of go down the row. So you would know, okay, on the fifth week, they're probably going to get to me. I better brush up and read this case a little bit closer to make sure I can answer these questions uh, a little bit better. And so at least from my perspective, it, it wasn't that that big of a deal. All right, the next scene I want to bring your attention to, because uh, I actually thought I really did enjoy this part. Do you remember the part of the movie where she attended this um, costume party, or it was supposed to be a costume party. It turns out it wasn't a costume party at all, and she was the only one there in costume. Do you remember that part of the movie? Yes, because Vivian, the vindictive brunette, told her it was right. a costume party when it wasn't just so she would be embarrassed, and it's really rude. Right, right. And that was a cringe-worthy moment. But what I love most about it is she just owned up to it. I mean, she, she just lived the part. She didn't leave in disgrace. She held her head high and just walked in there with the costume. You got to love that self-confidence. I tell you, Elwood exudes a self-confidence. So at least I love that part of the movie. Yeah, it's what any Cosmo girl would do. <laughs> That's what this is. I don't read Cosmo. Maybe I. It, that is interesting, but nonetheless, um, what about this aspect of the movie when they were competing for the top grade? It seemed like there's a lot of competition. Was your law school like that, where it was cutthroat between the various students to get that top grade? No, it wasn't really. And you know, I did have like a good 
section, my section was very, you know, there were a lot of smart students and, you know, very high achieving students in my section, but there wasn't, I never really felt like people were undermining each other or being too cutthroat or anything like that. It was kind of like, you know, the people who took it really seriously, studied really hard and worked really hard did the best. And that's, you know, how it should be. I, I have heard stories though about some other friends I have who went to different law schools where it is a little bit more, or according to them, was a little bit more cutthroat. But yeah, I didn't have that experience. Yes. But again, I did not go to Harvard Law. So who knows? Right, right, right. I am, um, uh, the law school I went to, University of Kansas, uh, we had this project first year where everyone wrote the same memo. It was an open memo. Uh, everyone basically had to research the same issues and, and write the same memo. And that was the, the, the assignment everyone had to do. And so by the time I got to the library to look up the, the particular relevant case law, those pages had been ripped out. So whoever got there first ripped out those pages so no one else would be able to review uh, the relevant material. And so it was a little competitive. That was the only experience I had. Of course, you, that's irrelevant now. Everyone does things on the computer. And so but at least that first memo, we were not allowed to use the computer. So it was a little bit of that. been crazy back when you had books. I don't even care. <laughs> I know. Can you imagine? There was a day when you actually did legal research in the library with actual books. I mean, that is so foreign to how we do law in, in real life. I can't imagine they even teach that nowadays. I can't imagine how many hours people were billing. I mean, it must have been just a different world. Because we, like, my first year of law school, we learned how to do research in the books. And I remember our legal research and writing professor saying, you know, like, I have to teach you this, but you're never going to use it. And we're all like, okay, well, that's kind of like, don't pay attention. You know, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't even know where to start. Honestly, if someone put me in a library full of books, like case, case reporters and said, like, write this (laughs) brief, like I would just start crying. I wouldn't even know where to start these days. It would take me like four days to even figure out where to begin and what the body of information that I needed to start with. Like, I I just wouldn't even know what to do. So it must have been such a different world. Like, it really must have. It was a totally different world. Like right now, like nowadays, uh, for you non-lawyers listening, uh, whenever we pull up a case on, let's just say Westlaw, there will be a little red flag in the corner saying, hey, pay attention. This case has been overturned or distinguished in some very significant way. You might want to read this negative history of this case. But in the old days, no, you would just be in a dusty old book. You'd have to then read all other kinds of cases and shepherdize it to know if that's still good law. It was a much different issue back in the old day, but nonetheless, um, uh, that is not real today. All right, what um, what else did you like about the, you know what I found was the most outlandish, unreasonable part of this movie? Mm-hmm. My. Some movies you watch and you say, okay, that's just not real life. That that depiction in the movie, I can't, you're losing me because now I can't even follow and trust this uh, this writing. Do you you know what I'm talking about? No, because to me, this is like not that far off base to real life. So you got to enlighten me. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. She had a dog named Bruiser who was a chihuahua. And apparently this chihuahua was a very nice dog. Have you ever actually met a nice <laughs> chihuahua? Um, that dog I mean, does not exist. That many chihuahuas, but like the Taco Bell one, right? I think they drug this dog. That is my only explanation. They must have been in some kind of PETA violation. There's no way a Chihuahua is that tame and lame. Those dogs act like the entire world is coming to a crashing halt. They yip and they yap and they bite, they snap. And so I found that to be rather outlandish. What about the bend and snap scene? Did you like that scene? I mean, it does have like an 85% rate of return on getting a second date or whatever she says. Really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, you love that scene. It's iconic. It's, you know, people still talk about it, just like the habeas corpus yes. scene. I still use that. I mean, I'm a dork too, but like, I still use that quote. Like, do you know what habeas corpus is? Because it's just, it's so great. Like, it has nothing to do with what's going on. It has nothing to do with, 
you know, getting this, her friend's dog back from the evil ex-husband or whatever. But like, sometimes when you just throw some legal jargon in there, it works wonders, you know? I mean, you just got to try it sometimes. So I love it. I love the whole thing. And, you know, Elle Woods is a very, she's precise. She's exacting. She knows she's not going to teach a nail salon full of women to bend and snap unless it is statistically proven to work. So, and it does. Right, right. The thing I love most about that bend and snap uh, episode or, or, or scene is when I saw that, it did, dawned on me how short Elle Wood is. I, mean, I had no idea she was that short. Do you know how short she was? Uh, I think she's about my height. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> whoops, <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, she's five foot one. And so, are you? Are you five foot one? I'm five two. Well, that's what my driver's Oh, then you're said. much taller. I could have. I don't know if I'm still. I'm old, so I might be shrinking. Who knows? But yeah, five you, foot two max. You, we'll say that. You are much taller, but if you watch this movie again in that bend and snap scene, look at Elwood and then look at the lady next to her who was, she was demonstrating this, this move to, it looks like, you know, David and Goliath. I mean, this other person is just like twice the height as Elwood, or at least it, it appears that way uh, from that, that scene. I, I, I went right past your habeas corpus. I mentioned that is so true. In law school, I remember my Taurus professor teaching us, look, in law school, we are going to teach you a lot of Latin, and, and here's why. You don't need it to practice law, but it sounds really cool at dinner parties. You can drop these Latin phrases. No one has any idea what you're saying, but you'll sound really cool. And so, hey, race ipsa loquitur or whatever those Latin phrases <laughs> are, um, teach them to the lawyers, and that way we can say them and sound really good. All right, well, what was your favorite part of, of um, Legally Blonde? Um, well, her outfit in the one scene where they're in Victor Garber's office talking about legal strategy for the murder trial where she has like okay. the polka dotted shirt and the red lipstick, I think that's just, it's timeless. It would still be a great outfit today and 10 out of 10, but plot wise, I mean, so the trial in this case, it's a, it's a murder trial because, you know, all <laughs> comedies that right. are about the law have to be a murder trial. Um, And it's the same formula as like every other, you know, funny legal movie, like the lawyer in this case, law student is messing up. They're kind of fumbling, looks like they're going to lose the case. And then they have this brilliant gotcha courtroom moment where they use their own ingenuity and creativity to undermine and impeach the witness or, you know, bring out some kind of smoking gun evidence and they end up winning the case. And, you know, the formula just, plays out beautifully here, I think. And, you know, it actually turns out that Elle Woods is able to win the case because not of her, you know, legal acumen, which has already been established at this point in the movie, but because she knows about ammonium thigalocalate, the active ingredient in (laughs) terms. So she uses her own knowledge outside of the courtroom which I think, you know, I mean, it's a funny movie. It's a superficial movie. Like, it's, you know, it is what it is. But I actually think right, there's right. like a kernel there where that's really true. Like, a good lawyer knows the law, knows the rules of evidence, knows the procedure, and knows how to work up a case. A great lawyer, right, has some creativity or way of connecting to real life what is going on in the courtroom. And that really does differentiate you know, a good lawyer, if you can explain something to the jury and really put them inside what's going on in this human drama that's playing out, that's what a great lawyer does. And so I think Elle Woods in this situation is a great lawyer. I mean, if she had lost the case, it would have been an effective assistance of counsel for sure, because like who lets a law student (laughs) defend uh, a murder defendant? But, you know, all's well that ends well, and any Cosmo girl would have known. Any Cosmo girl would have known. Now, yeah, the whole courtroom scene to me, it, it was it was it was a good movie, right? So it was fun to watch. Probably not going to ever happen in, in real life that you let someone that novice and green go up there, uh, you know, and just kind of stumble around. And then, of course, she. Well, the one thing I did like about that scene, and a lot of lawyers forget this, is that you gotta you can't forget to be in the moment and. 
the jury, they're human beings. And so they also are captivated about real issues. And so here, you know, as she was able to pursue this line of questioning, she, she was attentive. She was listening. She caught the person saying something and her gut said, hey, there's a this is a, a problem. There's, there's a hole here. So sometimes lawyers get so stuck to their outline and what they had thought was the issue going into it. They forget to listen. So I do like that aspect of this movie. All yeah. right. So what is your what is your grade here? What is your final outtake? Is this going to go in the lexicon of all time great legal movies or is this going to be overruled? No, I mean, I don't think it's any surprise. Like it's right up there. Hall of Fame. I'm all about it. And it's a very inspiring film to me personally. Right, right. <laughs> That is, that is good. You've already mentioned you are blonde and you are short. So I guess this is um, uh, a very personal movie. No, I, I am going to have to say I agree with you on this one. It, despite my the fact that um, I want to criticize the movie, it has been around for 20 years. It, is, it has staying power. People are still talking about it. It has definitely reached that kind of classic status uh, in lawyers, kind of like My Cousin Vinny, where there are, there are phrases and there's a you know legally blonde concept. Just a great wor- a piece of comedy here. And so this definitely has a stayed to the test of, or uh, endured the test of time. So I think we have to put it in our lexicon of greatest movies ever and so Elle Wood I guess she is a she's in the Hall of Fame of great lawyers out there why they didn't have a sequel Uh, I know they had the second sequel but maybe a third one that actually sees what she's like 20 years into the practice (laughs) yeah right she's just jaded like pushing paper behind (laughs) a desk like drinking drinking at lunch like you know Right. Over yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no longer dressed up. She doesn't care. She's doing DUIs. I don't know. But nonetheless, <laughs> a very, very good movie. All right. Thank you so much for having us on. Uh, have you thought about our next movie? Well, I guess so. We've kind of been going back and forth between drama and comedy. So I feel like we should do a drama. I mean, we haven't done Michael Clayton yet. So that's like a great one. And we did talk about. Michael Cohen and how he's a fixer. So that might be a natural segue, but I'm open to suggestions too. Let's do it. I, I like Michael Cohen. It's been a while since I've seen that movie. And so let's watch Michael Cohen. And the next time we get together, we'll unpack, is this actually a real legal movie? Is Does it involve real legal issues? Was this not predicting Michael Cohen? We will try to draw the similarities there. So thank you so much, Mackenzie, for joining us today. And we'll talk to you next time. Sounds good. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a five-star review. We need your love to help us continuing highlighting the funnier side of the law. I want to give a special shout-out to our Vice President of Operations, Wendy Oster, without whom this entire operation would be a mess. Our marketing team, Redbird Solutions, and Leanne Holmberg, for spreading the good word about us. Sean Wynn and 15.5 Features for making me sound way better than I actually do. And Ryan Kuhn and Paul Kuhn of Triplicity Marketing for our technical and computer support. 